Hello there. Thank you so much for joining me to have fellowship around God's word. Please turn with me your Bibles to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 can be divided into two, one to four, which has shepherd, sheep, relationship, God as a shepherd, David as the sheep, and then our text, verses five and six, we have hosts and a guest relationship with God as the host and David as the guest. One thing that is common to both divisions of the text, though, is the fact of God's provision, God's care for his own. And this idea is found in the very first verse. So look with me, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd i shall not want now from the statement the lord is my shepherd david is able to draw that conclusion that i shall not want in our text though not using the same words but communicating basically the same thought and therefore we can frame our text this way the teaching, as far as our text is concerned, because the Lord is my host, I shall not lack. Hallelujah. Please bow with me for a prayer. God, please bless your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the certain is things that pertained in Bible times. So it will be important that we acquaint ourselves with some of the things that pertain to this hosting in Bible times. Come with me to Luke chapter 7. In this chapter, Jesus had been invited to the home of Simon, a Pharisee. A woman showed up, obviously not invited. When she came, she did something that was wet. Noting which Jesus obviously noticed that and commented on it. In verse 37, we are told, and a woman in the city, which was a sinner, 
And this is, is said of her because she was into a lifestyle which the society frowned upon it. And what are we told about, about her? Brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. So, the woman's action did not go unnoticed. The host made a statement, but a statement of the host was not to the effect of condemning what she had done, but rather sought to cast doubt on the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus told the story subsequently, and then Jesus would give some explanation to all that the woman had done. So let's read verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house. Thou givest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. In Bible times, because people traveled on foot at such an invitation, by the time they get there, their feet would be dirty. They've washed down earlier though. So the host would provide water for the servant in the home to wash the feet of the guests. That did not happen. Simon did not do that. The woman, not part of the hosting family, did that with her tears wiping with her hair. Verse 45. Thou givest me no keys, but this woman since the time I came in, had not ceased to kiss my feet. Remember the story of um, Jesus at his betrayal by Judas and the sign of kissing? It was a sign of affection. Judas used that to betray Jesus' door. But it was a mark of a host, a good host, to shower approval, affection, happiness um, to the guests for accepting the invitation to come with cases which did not happen in this case. Verse 46, my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Scented grease, hosts before their guests and of course themselves enter the banquet hall or the dinner room would pour scented grease on the head of their host, their guests rather. But it did not happen. As far as uh, Simon doing that to Jesus was concerned. The woman, not part of the hosting family, would show up and do this. Now let's come to our text. David says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Our theme, the Lord my host. So what is this? What are the details of David having God as his host? And obviously it wasn't a one-off thing because the language suggests this is 
how God dealt with David. In other words, God would have David as his guest all the time. So David said, Thou preparest a table. Now, when he says, Thou preparest a table, preparest is the idea of arrange. That's the meaning of the word, arrange. And when it's a table, it is feast. So a, a feast was arranged by God. And something else that is said that makes it a bit hilarious. Look at it. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of who? My enemies. What? So David is the sole guest. But in the place where the feast was taking place were enemies of David. It kind of reminds me of uh, Haman and Mordecai. Ahasuerus, the king, was wondering what to do for someone that he was delighted in. Naaman showed up. His opinion was sought because he thought that who was better placed to be honored by the king than himself. So he suggested something really, really glamorous. And the king said, so be it. Go ahead and mention the name Mordecai. What? Remember, Hey man, all this while was looking for an occasion to exterminate the Jews. And Mordecai was number one on the list. How can he possibly be the person to carry out this glamorous decoration? of Mordecai. So this is what we have. The enemies are there, but they can't do anything. So David says, thou preparest a table before me in the sight, that is the idea, of my enemies. They were watching. What else at this dinner took place? Thou anointest my head with oil. So, as the custom was, before entering the, the dinner room or the banquet hall, scented grease is poured on the head of the guests by the host. David tells us that was done to him by God. And then David goes on to say, my cup ran it over. And let me take you to Psalm 104 and read verse 15. And wine that make it glad the heart of man. And oil to make his face shine. And bread which strengtheneth man's heart. Where we are particularly interested is a wine that make it glad the heart of man. What is that? It's about the excellent taste of the wine, the quality of it. It's exceptional. And so when David says that my cup ran it over, of course, he doesn't want us to understand that his cup of wine, the guest cup, it was filled to the brim and was overflowing. No, 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 that wasn't the idea. But rather, it was about the quality of the wine, the exceptional taste of it, the excellency of it, and the abundance of it, the quantity. That's what he means by 
the expression, my cup ran it over. Men and women, from this description of God's hosting of David, we learn one important truth, which is the lavish provision of God for his own. So our first idea is lavish provision. David paints a picture of God's provision. And he doesn't just provide. He provides for his own lavishly, like it took place at this feast. And so when we move to the next verse, that is the verse 6, David says, Surely, goodness and mercy. The word goodness, the Hebrew word tov, simply can mean good, pleasant. You know, something prosperous, a good thing. It can mean many things depending on the context. So basically what David is saying is good things will follow me. And then he says mercy, which simply means kindness or faithfulness. God's loyal kindness or his faithfulness. David says, would follow me. And when he says surely, he's basically saying only, only goodness and mercy shall follow me. Please come with me to Psalm 136. We have one of the two words, good here, mercy too we have, but it's not the same um, word. It's a synonym of it. So it's basically the same thing. So the, the, the two ideas we have here, that is a goodness and mercy, we have both um, here. And the psalmist says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. We we'll give thanks unto the God of gods. For his mercy endureth forever. We we'll give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders. For his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens. For his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. And then he comes here. Look with me, verse 24. And had redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endured forever. Who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endured forever. Who give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endured forever. This is what David is saying. He's saying that these, the goodness, the mercy of God will follow me. Only these would follow me. One may ask, really? Is that what happens to us all the time as the people of God? And was that the case with David? Was this smooth sailing? He had no worries, no pain, no anxieties? No, far from that. Psalm 132, please. Verse 1, Lord, remember David 
and all his afflictions. Do you see that? His afflictions. David was no stranger to afflictions. He knew pain. He knew misery. You remember? Many times he was a fugitive. Ran away from Saul. Ran away from even his own son, Absalom. So, he wasn't a man that had it all smooth sailing. No, it wasn't the case at all. But the point he's making, which in verse 4 of our chapter, he says, Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know what he's saying? It's an admission that tro trouble times will come. Misery, pain, neglect, famine. Not knowing where the next meal will come from. Neglect. Failure. These would attend the life of the believer. The Bible is very clear on this. Job 14 and verse 1. Man born of a woman is a few days but full of trouble. Why? Because since the fall of Adam and Eve, this has been the story. This has been the human story. Believers, non-believers would have their fair share. So David wasn't living in denial of this. No. But the point he makes that in the midst of these vicissitudes of life, in the midst of these worries and anxieties, In the midst of these sleepless nights, we will see God providing for us through it all. God will see us through. And so in verse 4, for example, we say, when I'm walking through the valley, of death. He says, your presence that is with me will see me through. And no adversity will leave its footprints on me. So not that troubles will not come, but we would have God with us through it. And that's what David says. His goodness, his kindness would attend me. And it says, all the days of my life. All the days of my life. So this is what I want you to note down. And the second idea, the continued provision of God for his own. The continued provision of God for his own. Remember the first idea? Lavish provision. This is coming from God. And so in this second idea, we have the continued lavish provision. And that's what David says. Surely, only these would attend my life. Not just for a moment, but all the days of my life. And then we come to the last bit of our text. And all these, in fact, going all the way to verse 1, all these are building up 
to this. This is the bottom line. Men and women, this is the crux of it. What should this lavish provision, this care, this continued provision of God for you and for me, what should that lead me and you to do? What should we do about it? Here, David says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The idea forever means length of days. However many days his life on earth will last. And what is I will do on the house of the Lord? David is saying, given God's lavish provision, which will continue all the days of my life, David says, the logical conclusion is this, to worship him. Men and women, the lavish provision, continued lavish provision of God should cause me and you to worship. It should arouse in us that sense of gratitude, of worship to God. That is, that is what this should lead us to. You see, it is sad that many of us would take from God all the blessings that he gives us, but we would hold on to the worship that he deserves. But David says, that ought not to be. The blessings of God should invoke in us worship, devotion, appreciation to God. And so he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I would dwell. I would look upon these blessings of God. A sign of his favor. And worship him as a result. Men and women, when David talks about the fact that God is his host, he speaks of God's provision, continuing provision. And then he wraps up with the idea that this provision should cause in us worship of God. That is the third idea. The provision of God should cause me and you to worship God. Men and women, it should not end there. We should not take the blessings of God and deny him his worship. That wouldn't be right. That ought not to be said about me and about you. May God bless me. May God bless you. As we continue to receive from God his lavish provision. And may this provision, this blessing of his, arouse in me, in you, that sense of worship, sense of gratitude, sense of devotion to God, the giver of our blessings. May God bless us all. Shall we pray? God, thank you for your word. We ask your blessings upon it in our hearts. In Jesus.
Just stay away. 